Welcome back if you're a subscriber or a return viewer. It seems the subscriber base is steadily growing, so I'm very grateful for that. If you're a new viewer, then thanks for clicking, and I do hope you enjoy the video. If you've been watching my mini lay series, you'll be well aware of the drama I've had with the cheap EEC I selected, and that I was working on a video on the topic. After mostly completing the EEC video, I then decided to widen the scope and make a small video series looking at electric motors in general. Anyway, this took a while to get everything together into something I felt comfortable with, so that's where we're at now. The point of the series will be a practical hands-on learning experience for electric motors and controllers. I'm not using any big words or complex math, or watching a bunch of other people's videos in advance to get the answers. This is simply my own journey of discovery. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not belittling the importance of math or the great videos that other people make. It's just a way of learning that works for me. In this first video, I'm still going to do a teardown of the cheap EEC as a start point, both to answer some questions and likely to create some new ones. The following videos will then take a look at how magnets work, how electric motors work, and finally we'll swing back and take a look at the cheap EEC with an oscilloscope in order to answer any remaining questions. Now even though I had some general idea about how all this stuff works, I really learned a lot through this series, and I hope you do too. Okay, let's get to it. So I purchased this ESC on Amazon for around about 33 US dollars. It says it can handle 200 amps, can use 2 cell up to 7 cell LiPo batteries. That would be an operational range of around about 7 to 26 volts. It also states it does not include a battery eliminator circuit or BEC, which is usually used to power receivers or servers. In total, I ended up with three of these ESCs on hand. The first one, which was faulty out of the box, a second one sent as a replacement for the first one, and a third one which I bought as a spare. Ultimately, all three of these ECs failed in one way or another. So with the cover taken off, and you can see there's a main board here on top, and below that there's these three identical MOSFET switching boards. All four of the board's power inputs are soldered together using big via holes for the plus and minus rails. There are also five 270 microfarad capacitors soldered onto the boards in different locations, but all just connect to the same power input, likely there to take up any slack for any fast current demands. Then at the other end of the board here, there's a 15 pin uh, header strip which connects all four boards together in parallel. Everything's just hard soldered together. You can see the MOSFET boards are sandwiched together pretty tightly. And the outermost MOSFET board is where the heat sink is loosely located. So basically this means the innermost boards must transmit their heat through the board stacked on top. And then this heat ultimately makes its way to the heat sink that's facing outside. It doesn't seem like a great design to me. And one would assume the poor old board in the middle must be getting especially toasty. Now I've already dismantled all of the ECs I got and bodged together this Frankenstein version which I'm currently using in the mini lathe. The primary change I made was to ensure that each MOSFET board now has its own dedicated heatsink. This new arrangement also makes the EEC easier to repair and can help limit collateral damage should something else decide to fry itself. So I have enough leftover parts for another EEC and it'll be these parts that we'll be using during this video series. Now first let's take a close look at the MOSFET board. There's not much to them really. You can see this one's got a couple of burnt out MOSFETs here, so don't worry about those. In total, on each board there are 18 identical MOSFETs, each with a little resistor close by. They're arranged as three rows, or channels, and the output of each of the channels ultimately goes to one of the three wires on the motor. So six MOSFETs for each channel, arranged as three MOSFETs that can connect the output to the plus side of the input supply, and for your reference this is known as high side switching. And the other three MOSFETs uh, that can connect the output to the negative side of the input supply. And this is called uh, low side switching. Since all three wires going to the motor have the same MOSFET arrangement, this provides a way to flow current through the motor's windings in either direction. Now an eye opener about this design for me was the fact that the switching arrangement could in fact generate a short circuit should the high and low side MOSFETs activate at the same time. But a little bit of internet research shows that this arrangement seems pretty typical so mitigation of this risk can only really happen in the control part of the design. Now the small resistors that we see next to the MOSFETs are connected in series with the MOSFETs control input, probably there for protection, 47 ohms for the high side ones and 33 ohms for the low side ones. As I think I indicated a little bit earlier, all three MOSFET boards are identical, with the control signals and the channel outputs all connected together in parallel. Really you only need one of these MOSFET boards to get the EC to function, albeit at a reduced capacity. If you think about it, actually you only need a total of 6 MOSFETs to make this EEC work, but this design has a total of 54. So why? Well it's designed this way to increase the total current capability of the system, while still being able to use fairly cheap MOSFETs. In theory this means instead of having, for example, 200 amps running through one MOSFET, 
the load will be divided up between 9 MOSFETs, meaning a single MOSFET only needs to cope with about 33 amps max. And while we are talking about the MOSFETs, uh, for the first two ESCs I dismantled, there was no make or model markings to be found. It looks like the original markings have been scrubbed, so this is a big red flag. I think it's fair enough to suspect that these MOSFETs are either rejects and or not up to the required specification. Interestingly, however, for the third EC I got, some of the MOSFETs are actually marked with a model number. The markings show they are Fairchild FDD 8896s with a seemingly appropriate specification of 30 volts, 94 amps, and 5.7 milliohms switch resistance. Now I tested the switch on characteristics and found that the marked MOSFETs started switching on a couple of volts higher than the unmarked ones. So I think it's fair enough to conclude that the marked ones and the unmarked ones are in fact not the same thing. And even though the marked MOSFETs seem like they're the real deal, there's still a fair likelihood that they're either fake or from the reject pile. Now the quality and design of the MOSFET board's PCB itself doesn't seem all that bad really. But the original heatsink arrangement is concerning and the MOSFETs being used are pretty suspicious, so overall not really inspiring much confidence. Okay, enough of that, uh, let's take a look at the main board and see what we can figure out. Firstly I need to point out that to make the boards easy to work with I've added these uh, PCB headers on either side. This is not the standard configuration. Now the easiest component on the board to identify is this 7805 5 volt linear regulator which undoubtedly is being used to power the microcontroller. Next to this we have something that looks like a buck converter. Now as this EC is sold as not having a BEC, I assume this buck converter must be feeding the 5 volt regulator, maybe doing this for efficiency reasons. But actually the 7805 is powered directly from the main power input, so this leaves the buck converter being a bit of a mystery. The markings on the buck converter indicate that it's a LM2596S minus 5.0 SP+. Looking at the spec sheet, this gives a 7 to 40 volt input range and is meant to output 5 volts uh, up to 3 amps. Now following through the circuit a bit, I found that its output only goes to an empty pad next to where the receiver cable is. But the receiver cable voltage wire is purposely not connected, it was just floating nearby. Also, measuring the unloaded voltage output of the buck converter gave around about 6 volts, which seems to show that it's functioning, but possibly outputting a higher voltage than indicated by the spec sheet. Now my theory is that the seller was getting caught out for having the out of spec BEC voltage, so they just decided to disconnect it, and sell it as not having one. Now on the other side of the 7805, depending on the board, there's either a MAX662 or an ST662A from different manufacturers, but apparently functionality-wise identical chips. Looking at the datasheet, it shows that these chips are voltage step-up converters intended to generate a voltage necessary for programming flash memories. So when I first saw this, I was scratching my head a bit. These chips didn't seem to make sense in this particular context. But after following the circuit through, I found that these chips are being used not for their design purpose, but instead are being used to supply power to these MOSFET driver chips, which require at least 10 volts to work. These 662 chips can step up a 5 volt rail to 12 volts at currents up to 30 milliamps, which is apparently enough for this application. Now I'm not sure if using these 662 chips like this for ESCs is something common, or if it's something peculiar that this designer has done. Who knows really. At first I wondered why they just didn't use a 7812 regulator to make the 12 volt rail. But then I remembered this ESC needs to support LiPo batteries with as few as two cells, meaning the supply voltage could even be lower than 7 volts. So naturally you can't regulate 12 volts from 7, so the need for the 662 chip becomes pretty clear. Okay, uh, let's next take a look at the MOSFET driver chips that the 662 chips are powering. They are marked as being IR2101S. The chip is made by an international rectifier, with the datasheet calling them a high and low side driver. Now this is something new for me. Given that there are three of these chips located right next to the bus connecting to the MOSFET boards, I think it's a fair assumption that there is one chip dedicated to each of the output channels. So when I first saw these chips, I wondered if these chips were doing some type of special modulation or other type of heavy lifting, something to reduce the workload of the microcontroller. But it turns out to be a little simpler, but also a little more complex than what I first thought, just in different ways. To understand this, we need to take a closer look at what's happening when switching the low and high side MOSFETs. Now if you don't know, uh, different to a transistor which is controlled by current, MOSFETs are controlled by using a voltage. And when we're talking about a voltage, we're only talking about a relative difference in charge as seen between two different points. With the keyword here being relative, you can't just measure a voltage as a single point alone. It must be relative to something. For example, 
we have a common reference point, which we call zero volts, and then we measure to a point A, which returns, say, three volts, and then we measure from zero volts to a point B that gives us five volts, we now know that measuring from point A to B will give us two volts. Or if we go the other way, B to A, we'll get negative two volts. Anyway, just remember voltage is going to be relative. Now I know many of you know this stuff, but just want to level the playing field before we get to this next bit. This CEC is using an N-channel MOSFET, which is a pretty common type of MOSFET for this type of application. For N-channel MOSFETs, if you apply a voltage to the gate, uh, which is a control input for the MOSFET, this will allow current to flow through the MOSFET, between the MOSFET strain being positive and the MOSFET source being negative. The voltage applied to the gate is as seen relative to the MOSFET source. This is called the VGS, or the voltage relative between the gate and the source. For most applications, MOSFETs are just being used as simple on or off switches. The VGS is set to zero volts for the MOSFET to switch off, or the VGS is set to something like five volts for the MOSFET to be fully switched on. This is technically known as reaching saturation. So now we all know how these MOSFETs work, let's take a look at how that applies to the high and low side switching for this ESC. The low side switching is pretty straightforward. As the source side of the MOSFET is directly connected to the negative side of the power supply, simply connecting 5 volts to the gate will result in a VGS of 5 volts, so the MOSFET's going to switch on. In fact, as the gate's current draw is so low, the 5 volt signal could come directly from the microcontroller without a problem. Unfortunately for the high side switching, where we are switching the positive side of the power supply to the load, everything is not so simple. Let's look at this circuit for a high side switch working with a supply voltage of 24 volts. We know that when the MOSFET is in the off state, no current will go through the load. To calculate the voltage at the MOSFET source, we can use the formula voltage equals current times the load's resistance. And since the current is zero, we know the voltage must also be zero. At zero current, the load's resistance really is irrelevant. So when the MOSFET is off like this, if we tried to use a five volt signal to switch the MOSFET on, since the VGS would be five volts, you would expect the MOSFET to turn on. But there's a problem. Once the MOSFET switches on, effectively closing the switch's contacts, the voltage at the source will quickly become something close to 24 volts. So with that, the VGS would change to being something like minus 19 volts, causing the MOSFET to slam back into the off state. Now of course this vicious cycle will repeat, likely at a very high frequency too. Naturally, this is not what we want, and gives a pretty high chance of undesirable consequences too. So to reliably switch a MOSFET on or off in this high side type of situation, we preferably need to create an on or off voltage which is always relative to the source, and not a voltage that is relative to the power supply's ground. And really, this is the most important thing that this IR2101 chip does, and why it exists in this design. For the low side, the IR2101 chip is really only acting as a simple buffer, with the on and off signals created, all relative to the power supply's zero volt level. But for the high side, the on and off signals created are actually floating, created relative to the current voltage as seen at the MOSFET source. This is all regardless of the instantaneous supply voltage, load, or MOSFET's switch state. Looking at the data sheet, I found the voltage used for the on state is taken from the chip's supply voltage, which can be from 10 to 20 volts. In our case here, the supply voltage will be 12 volts as supplied by that 662 chip. Now finally, we get to look at the microcontroller, an Atmel Atmega 8. The datasheet indicates that it's a vanilla microcontroller, nothing specialized for EC application. Actually, it just looks like a cut-down Atmega uh, 328, you know, the one that's used in the Arduino Uno. Without even looking, we can guess that the receiver's PWM signal is coming directly into the microcontroller, and then we're going to see three sets of low and high control signals that are going to go to those IR2101 chips. There's likely going to be a voltage divider on the main supply somewhere going to the microcontroller so that it can measure the current supply voltage. And the microcontroller also needs to know something about the motor's current position so that it can get the switching timing correct. Now as this is a sensorless arrangement, this must be done by back EMF on the motor, but as there is no dedicated hardware to process such a signal on this board here, I guess that each of the phases of the motor's output is somehow connected to the microcontroller. Anyway, we'll try to figure that out in a later episode when we break out the oscilloscope. So that's it for this teardown, but with a sample size of just this one chip ESC, it's impossible to draw good conclusions about what might be typical or not. And while it's more than likely that a large number of ECs out there do use custom silicon, for this ESC, they have simply stuck to pretty commonly available parts. Really, the high and low side driver chips is the only thing on the board that seems somewhat functionally specific to the ESC's design. Everything else is pretty much generic.
So in the end, my take from this teardown was that there does not appear to be anything here that would stop you from making your own ESC. And actually, in some circumstances, doing just that could make a lot of sense. So I'll leave it at that for this episode. In the next episode, we'll be doing some practical playing around with magnets and electromagnets. I can pretty much feel a bunch of you rolling your eyes around right now on hearing that topic. But give it a chance. I think it can be interesting to go back and test what we think we know. It also lays a useful foundation for the following episode. So I do hope to see you then. And as always, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe if you enjoyed the video.